Thanks, Danny. All right, if you are able, please rise for the reading of our scripture this morning. We're going to be in 1 John 4, 13 through 21. 1 John 4, 13 through 21. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have a confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and however, whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has, who he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. You may be seated. As we begin today, I want to remind you, uh, as a church, we're praying. Uh, we've been praying. We continue to pray. We want to be a church of prayer. And we're praying specifically, and I hope you're joining me in this every day, asking God for wisdom and direction. God, where do you want us? What do you want us to do? Where do you want us to serve? We want to hear your voice. We want to know because you're our head and we're the body. And we don't want to be disconnected from you. And as we learned a couple of weeks ago, it's also important that we would uh, have wisdom and direction because it, it helps, that wisdom helps us to discern between truth and lies. So it helps us to know what we should avoid and what we should, what we, what is not true, what is not right. We're also praying that God would give us opportunities to share the love of Christ with our neighbors and with our family members, right? People around us, that God would bring people into our lives that we can tell them about Jesus, tell them about the good news. Say, hey, there's something that you're missing in your life, and I've experienced it, and I want to tell you about it because I love you. And I hope that you're having those opportunities. I believe that God wants to give us those opportunities. Because he gave us a commandment. He sent, sent us out and said, go into all the world and make disciples of the nations. So why wouldn't he send us, especially if we're asking him to do it? And then the last thing, we're praying that God would give us, uh, that he would demonstrate his power among us. That this would not be a church that, that is dead because we believe in a dead God. We want to believe in a God who is alive, who's living, who's still working in the world, and we're asking for him to demonstrate himself, to encourage us, to show himself among us. And so those three things are the things that we're praying about. So let's, let's go to the Lord before we jump into this passage. Father, I pray that you would give clarity this morning. More than anything else, Lord, I want us to hear you. Lord, there's some difficult things that we're going to hear this morning. And you may challenge our hearts. Lord, I pray that you find our hearts soft towards you, ready to hear, ready to listen, ready to obey. Father, we, uh, we're, we are so needy today, probably more than we know. And we need to interact with our Father. We need you to come and restore us we need you to come and minister to our hearts. Bring us joy. Help us in our distress and in our sorrow. Father, you see it all. You see our hearts. You know what we need. And so we come before you. We ask you to nourish us, to fill us up with you. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Well, all right, this passage um, that we're looking at today is a longer passage. And so that we don't get lost, um, I've prepared a summary of this passage. And we're going to look at it, and I'm going to preach through that summary side by side with with John as he is giving this, so that we kind of have an idea of, of where we're going. We don't lose sight of that. So here's the summary here. This is how we know. Okay, this is... and, and what do we what do we know we this is a confidence this is an assurance that he's talking about and he says this is how we know what it what is it that we know that we abide in god and that he abides in us okay that's what we know how do we know it we know it by the holy spirit so this is how we know that we abide in god and he in us by the holy spirit and by the holy spirit we confess and we've come to believe in the perfecting love of god that is made manifest in Jesus, sent, sacrificed, resurrected, and glorified. This is the gospel. This is the good news that we've, that we've heard and that we proclaim. This perfecting love gives us confidence, so much confidence, absolute confidence, so that there is no fear on the day of judgment. It will also give us a love for God and a love for our brothers. And he concludes by saying, so we must love our brothers, okay? So if we look at the first part of John's message here in 1 John 4, 13 and 15, he says, by this we know and we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we've seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. And so that part of the summary that we're going to look at is this is how we know that we abide in God and He in us by the Holy Spirit. Now again, like I said, this is how we know. This is what, this is what John is saying is the theme of this whole book. In 1 John 5, 13, he says, I write these things so that you would know that you have eternal life. He wants us to know. He wants us to have confidence and there is confidence in this. It does let us know. But these are not conditions. What we've been learning are not conditions. Um, if you do this, then God will abide in you. Rather, this is evidence of what God is doing in you. Okay? Let's look at a quote by James Boyce. He says, To believe in Christ and to love the brethren which are two signs that John has been hammering time after time, verse after verse, circling around, circling back to these things, repeating them over and over again, to believe in Christ and to love the brethren, not conditions by which we may dwell in God, but rather are evidences of the fact that God has already taken possession of our lives to make that possible. I... And it goes back to last week where he says, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a propitiation for our sins. And this week we're going to hear him say, say, we love God because he loved us first. Right? So these are evidences of this God who takes initiative and steps into our lives different from any other God, any other religion that you'll find out there that has to go to the gods to beg them to, to, to pay attention, to give them some type of sacrifice, to live some type of life that they would recognize. But instead, we see the gospel and we see the message of Jesus is vastly different. That God comes to us first. There's also this confidence in our union with God. I want to point this out. That, that um, John says, says that this is how we know that we abide in him and he in us. There's this reciprocated type of relationship, this reciprocated type of abiding, this connection that's divine that God is having with us. That he is dwelling in us and we are dwelling in him. I don't really know what that means. 
But I, it has this idea of completeness, right? It has this idea of a bond and a connection that is strong. Now, let me ask you this question. The purpose of 1 John is so that we will have assurance of salvation. So as we've gone through this book, we're getting towards the end of chapter 4 right now. The question should be, do we have a greater confidence? Has this book helped us to have a greater confidence in our salvation? That God is in us and that we are in God, that we're connected to him? Do we have that kind of assurance as we have been studying together? Has it given us greater discernment in those who call themselves Christians? Do we have things to look for in their lives that give us an assurance and, and let us know that they are true believers? I think, that it, it's, I think this is not a bad study. I think it's a great study for us. Because assurance is this, it's a tricky thing, right? I can have assurance and confidence on one day. It seems like the next day I don't, right? And I vacillate between the two. My, my heart seems, or my mind seems fickle. It's like that, you know, pulling, pulling the, the petals off of a daisy. He loves me. He loves me not. Or maybe he loves me. I don't know, maybe he doesn't. So to have assurance is great. And even when our hearts aren't there, man, this is, this is the stuff we need to know. These are the questions we need to ask. Do we love God's commands? Do we love our brothers? Are we being discerning about the messages that are coming to us, knowing that there are spirits that have gone out into the world and they're using false prophets as their mouthpieces? Are we examining what is being said to us? Are we finding our hearts growing cold to the world. And when I say the world, I'm not talking about the lost, people who don't know Jesus. I'm talking about a world system, a ruler of this world, the desires of this world, the things that it promotes. Do we find ourselves falling deeper and deeper in love with God and with Jesus? Are we pursuing him? These are the questions we need to ask. Now, how are we to know he says, this is how we know that we have and have this confidence, that we abide in him. We know this by the Holy Spirit because God has given us of his spirit. Now that's a kind of a weird construction, isn't it? Why does he say it that way? He's given us of his spirit. Literally in the Greek, that means he's given us out of his spirit or from his spirit. But that's still not helpful to me. I still don't understand why he's saying it that way. And I know, as I read through of that, some of you are keen and perceptive and saw that and was like, yeah, that's kind of weird. And I, let me let you know, there are two phrases in this passage that are kind of weird, right? This is the first one. So let me address it. What does it mean? Well, one of the commentaries that I frequent, uh, completely skipped this verse. I don't know if it was just too hard or it was unimportant, but they skipped it. Um, so actually, I couldn't find a better commentary on this than the book of First John, right? And so this is how we interpret scriptures. We do it by scripture when it, when it helps us, and this is a perfect uh, example of that. What does he mean by saying he's given us of his spirit? Well, let's look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. So if you have that, your Bibles, 1 John 3, 24. And in fact, if, yes, keep that slide up there. Because I'm going to read 1 John 3, 24, and I want you to look at this 1 John 4, 13 and 15, because they're so similar. He says this in 1 John 3, 24, whoever keeps his command abides in God and God in him. That's similar. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. 
okay? So the Holy Spirit then is vital to our assurance because that's what God has given us so that we will know, okay? Now, why does he say it in a, in a different way? I don't know. Uh, maybe he's just trying to mix up, you know, how he's saying this phrase, but it's almost identical to what he said before. And in that phrase, he's saying, the Spirit whom he has given us. The Spirit that we are given is a Spirit of truth. He leads us into the light of the gospel and then he gives witness that we belong to God. When we studied Ephesians together, we get Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, the Holy Spirit is given to believers as a sign, as a promise, he says, as a seal of our inheritance. And I don't know if you remember back to Ephesians, that was like a year and a half ago, Ephesians chapter 1, but I, I gave the example of like a luggage tag, right? that your luggage is marked. It says who it belongs to, right? And if you've ever lost your luggage, you, you're hoping that that luggage tag still survived and that there's a phone number on so they can call you and let you know that you, your luggage has been found. It's, been, it's marked. And that's what the believer is. We are marked, we are sealed with, with the name of Jesus, saying that we belong to him. And that seal is the Holy Spirit given to us. Romans, 6, uh, Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay? So that verse is saying that the Spirit is somehow communicating to my spirit that I belong to God. There's a way that the Spirit communicates to us to give us assurance. But I've read that verse before, and that some, somehow feels subjective to me. I don't know, maybe to you. I don't... Feel, sometimes I don't feel like I have the Spirit. I really can't feel Him. I can't see Him. He's intangible. He's invisible. So how do we know if the Spirit is present? Well, let's continue on because I think John answers that question. By the Holy Spirit, we confess and we've come to believe in the perfecting love of God made manifest in Jesus, sent, sacrificed, resurrected, glorified. This is the gospel. And John says, and that's my summary of John saying, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And so we've come to know and to believe the love of God, the love that God has for us. God is love. Okay, that phrase right there, every time we hear God is love, we need to understand the gospel, right? We need to remember last week that that verse that I just quoted to you, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. The sending of his son, this is, this is how we know love. This is what it means that God is love. The gospel is, is right in those three words, God is love. And whoever abides in love, in that gospel, abides in God, and God abides in him. So this, this, this next, these next lines that John gives us speak to the witness of the apostles that's gone out. And those who confess Jesus is the Son of God are the ones who abide in him. Now this is interesting because we started this chapter, chapter 4, talking about testing spirits, right? Looking at their confession, what they publicly profess, examining their message. This is their confession, right? You can't, they can't hide it. But neither can we. And I, I don't know if you remember two weeks ago, I said that we also have a confession that we make with our lives. So the question for us today is, what are we confessing? What are our lives proclaiming? Do we confess that Jesus is the Son of God? That Jesus is preeminent, that he's all important, that he's central to my life and to my pursuits? Has your life been changed by a drastic reorientation of worship of yourself and of idols and the world to worship of Jesus? the King of kings, the Son of God. 
If so, that's because you were given the Spirit of God. And this is how we know that we've come to believe in the love of God, that the, in the love of God that, that He has demonstrated towards us in Jesus and that we are abiding in it. Again, this is much more than just mental assent or, or some kind of understanding of, of the, the story of, of the Bible. It's, it's more than just understanding and being able to explain the Roman road or I don't know if you guys remember in, in uh, Vacation Bible School the bracelets that you're given with the rainbow beads in each color represented. Some. It's more than just understanding and being able to explain that. That's what I'm saying. It's, it, it, is, it becomes a co confession of our lives. It becomes the life that we live. We embody this message. We desire to know the commands of God, and it's a joy for us to obey them. We have a connection and a bond to other believers, and we find opportunities to pursue and strengthen those relationships. In fact, we really like hanging out with other people who believe in God. Our love for the world is waning. And like I said, it's not for the lost, but for the kingdom of this world and all that it offers. And we do. We're, we're, we're vigilant to reject false messages sent to distort the truth and bring division among us. John continues. He says, This perfecting love will give us confidence, absolute confidence, with no fear on the day of judgment. And in 1 John 4, 17 and 18, he says, By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. That is the other interesting phrase that's in here. We'll explain that in a second. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now listen, this is great. By this is love perfected. Perfect love does perfecting work in those being perfected. Perfect, perfect, perfect. John uses this three times. And he uses this word to show and give a sense of completion, of complete completeness, of fullness. Let me say that again. Perfect love does perfecting work in those being perfected. Now let's unpack that a little bit. This fullness of love gives us confidence. Absolute confidence. I want to have absolute confidence. I want to have confidence that is sure. Confidence that is unshakable. No matter what comes, I'm confident. I know it's true. This reality. Can you imagine having that kind of confidence? Also, look at, at one of the, the goals of this divine love and its perfecting work is that it replicates itself. Love is perfected with us and we will be perfected in love. This perfect love comes into our lives and then it begins to spread and consume and then be replicated out of us. This is the perfecting love of God. This is the perfecting work that brings confidence in the day of judgment. Now, the day of judgment. Uh, the Bible talks about this. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all, all of us, appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, when I was young in the faith, I thought that we would get to, as, as a believer, I would get to avoid the judgment seat of Christ, right? But that's not true. That's not true. We will be there, and we will be judged, uh, and we will receive what is due for us in the body, whether good or evil. Another scripture says there, there's appointed once for a man to die, 
And then comes the judgment. It means that, that we only have a limited amount of time to choose God, to, to respond to him, to receive his love. And, the, and then after death comes, the time is, that time is past. And we will, we will be judged based on what we do with this divine love that's been revealed to us in Jesus. Do we receive it into our lives and make it a, a part of who we are? It becomes the heartbeat of our life. Or do we reject it? Do we, do we dismiss it? Well, for those who dismiss it, they have to stand before God's judgment and his wrath on that day. The question, will God, who is a God of love, <laughs> judge the world? And some people may ask that because they have an understanding of love that comes from our culture that says you're going to love me based on how I feel like I want to be loved. But God, as we defined love last week, is committed to a sacrificial love that looks out for the, our eternal good in real and tangible ways. He cares about our eternal good. And so he will judge the world. Because God cannot dismiss our sin. And God cannot love everyone just as they are. Now, last week I said this, and I don't know if it perked up some of your ears. I said, God does not love you just the way that you are. I said, he doesn't. All right? Now, that may have made some of you go, oh, is he speaking heretically? God loves you just the way that you are is not in the Bible. Now, I can affirm the first part of it. God loves you. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Just the way that you are. If he loved you just the way that you are, he would have to approve of the way that you are, which is sinful. He sent his son because you were just the way that you are. If he never required you to be more than just the way that you are, then the cross is meaningless. He loves you. And he wants to set you free. He wants you to walk in the way that he created you to walk. And in order for him to do that, he has to solve your problem, which is a problem of your sin which is just the way that he finds you, just the way that he finds me. God loves you, and he doesn't want you to be just as you are. He wants you to be holy, just as he is holy. But God, who is a holy God, and who hates my sin and your sin, will one day judge humanity Judge the humanity that rejects and sacrifices his son and who also rejected his demonstration of love. Now, this, this weekend, uh, Kristen has been listening to several conferences that have been uh, going on in different places in the country. And as, as a result of that, I've been listening to uh, a lot of these conference speakers and a lot of these uh, great uh, theologians and pastors who are preaching. And what's interesting is that many of them went to Psalm uh, chapter 2. Not a psalm that I uh, preached from last summer, uh, but I was eager to do it. Uh, and I want to read it to you today. This is why God judges the world. We read in Psalm chapter 2, Why do the nations rage? And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Verse 4 says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. 
he laughs at them, and he holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I've exalted the king. And then if you skip down to uh, 10. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son. Kiss the king. Give your allegiance to him lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Man, that warning. That warning going out to the world. Blessed are those who take refuge in Messiah, in the king that God has exalted. This son that he sent to be a propitiation for your sin and take care of the wrath of God, find refuge in him. That's why the day of judgment will strike fear into the hearts of every man, woman, and child, except, except for the confident believer. He says this, why? Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Here's that second weird phrase. What does that mean? As he is, so also are we in this world. Again, we go to John's gospel to help us understand this confusing phrase. If we look in John 15, 9 and 10, we read this, and I'll break it down. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Okay? So the Father's loving the Son, and the Son is loving his disciples that he's talking to. He says, abide in my love. Stay in my love. Live in my love. Dwell in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Okay? So all you have to do to abide in that love is obey my commandments. Just as, or in the same way, I have kept my Father's commands and I abide in His love. Okay? So what he's saying is while in the world, Jesus was keeping the Father's commandments and He was in the Father's love. That's, that is what John is saying. So in the same way, the believer in Jesus is in the Father's love in the world as we are obedient to His commands. So let me break it down that because as he is, so also we are, are we in this world. Because as he, as Jesus is, is what? In the Father's love, so also in the same way are we in the Father's love in this world. Now, because we are in the Father's love, we don't have anything to fear. In this world or in the world to come, on the judgment day, we will be objects of his love, not objects of his wrath. His perfect love that we abide in, cast out, it completely obliterates and eliminates the need for fear. In the day when the only fear that will be left will be a fear of the Lord, as everything is, the worlds are stripped away and we stand before him. The only thing left to fear will be God. And for some, that will be terrifying. But for us, man, I think we might be a little excited to see God face to face instead of fear to experience joy because fear has to do with punishment and our punishment was paid for on the cross. You're not an object of his wrath. You're an object of his love if you abide in him. If you are in the Father's love, now and then there is nothing to fear. Now, I heard someone just the other day say, I must have done something wrong and I'm getting punished for it. Because this is just a lot of wrong things have been happening. Okay? Let me just answer that and say, 
No, it's not punishment. Now, the Lord does discipline us as his, as his sons and daughters because he loves us, right? That's different, but it's not punishment, and we don't need to mix those things up because there is no more punishment. We just need to get it into our heads. You're an object of God's love, and he's displaying you to the world as an object of his love. Oh, that's really good. And I have no idea where I was. Okay, so if we are fearful, if we are saying that, if we're saying, hey, you know what? I, I fear God's punishment. Either we're, we are in our sin and we're, and we're facing judgment. We have not received his forgiveness. Or maybe as a believer, we just lack assurance. Remember I said assurance is a fickle thing. It's a tricky thing. And maybe we doubt and we need to be reminded to abide in the love of the Father. We need to be reminded of the love of the Father. And remember, remember, always remember, because you're going to hear this, perfect love cast out fear. Remember the context where this is coming from, right? This is about the day of judgment, and the fear that's talked about is a fear of punishment and wrath. Okay, let's look at these next. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, there's only seven? Seven beautiful words. We love because he first loved us. Not only will he give us confidence on the day of judgment, but he will also give us a love for God and a love for our brothers. Now, uh, this next section, I'm just going to lean on Charles Spurgeon heavily. Charles Spurgeon uh, was a man of the word, and he preached the word faithfully. He was not prone to repeat himself. But when it came to these seven words, he spoke five different sermons. And, this, and he was just fixated on this, right? We, he, he broke it down first in a sermon where he just focused on the first three words. We love him. Describing every true follower of Jesus. This is a quote from him. This, there is no exception to this rule. If a man loves not God, neither is he born of God. Show me a fire without heat, then show me regeneration that does not produce love to God. Everybody knows. He, he, he's comparing our, our regeneration to, to, to what a fire does. A fire gives off heat. And on Thursday nights, especially this time of the year, I am, you can see me. The guys know, they see me kind of creep closer and closer and closer to the fire till I'm as close as I can be, right? Because I need that heat. I expect that heat. A fire without heat is worthless, and it doesn't exist. In the same way he's saying regeneration that does not produce love for God does not exist. There is no exception to the rule. Those who follow Jesus Love Jesus. He also says this, and I think this is a beautiful quote, although it's long, it's good. He says, look through all the pages of history and put to the noblest men and women who seem to still live this question, who loves Christ? And at once from the dark dungeons and the cruel racks there arises the confessor's cry, we love him. And from the fiery stake where they clapped their hands as they were being burned to death, the same answer comes, we love him. If you could walk through the miles of the catacombs at Rome, and if the holy dead whose dust lies there could suddenly wake up, they would all shout, we love him. The best and bravest of men, the noblest and the purest of women have all been in this glorious company. So surely, surely, you are not ashamed to come forward and to say, put my name down among them. Put my name down among them. Let me count, be counted among those who say with their dying breath, man, I love him. I love him. He also breaks it down in, into this, uh, just focusing on the word first. He first loved us, which means he loved us before time, before the world was created. When we only existed in the mind and the heart of God, Jesus loved us then. 
He loved us while we were still sinners in the depth of our depravity and in our rebellion. He loved us when we were utterly lost. He loved us when we rejected God before that we even knew that we needed him. Charles Spurgeon says, Jesus loved you when you lived carelessly, when you neglected his word, when the knee was unbent in prayer. Ah, he loved some of you while you were dancing in the saloon, when you were in the devil's playhouse. Aye, even when you were in the brothel, not the bothel, the brothel, right? That makes sense to people who live here. He loved you when you were at hell's gates and drank damnation at every draught. He loved you when you could not have been worse or further from him than you were. Marvelous, marvelous, O oh Christ, is your strange love. Strange love that loves us when we have nothing to give back and when we deserve it. We don't deserve it at all. And then, of course, he's, he preached a sermon saying, we loved him be, because. And he focused on because, because he first loved us. The first, uh, this verse uh, tells us where our love comes from and why we love Jesus. It comes from him. Our love for God is always a response to his love for us. He initiates and we respond. We never have to draw God to us like other religions. He draws us to himself. Charles Spurgeon says this, I've sometimes noticed that in addressing Sunday school children, it is not uncommon to tell them that the way to be saved is to love Jesus, which is untrue. Hmm. I, I made me stop and go, what are you saying, Charles? The way to be saved for a man, woman, or child is to trust Jesus for the pardon of sin to believe in him, to believe in his promise, and then trusting in Jesus, then love comes as a fruit. Love is by no means the root. Faith alone accomplishes that place. We love him because he first loved us. We're not the origin of this. He is. This verse also tells us why. The why is, um, he, he explains by saying, Yet we must not try to make ourselves love, God, love our Lord, but to look to Christ's love first. For his love to us will beget in us love to him. I know that some of you are greatly distressed because you cannot love God as much as you would like to do, and yet you keep on fretting because it is so. And he said, here's his instruction. Now just forget your own love to him and think of his great love to you. And then immediately, your love will come to something more like that which you de de desire it to be. If you want your love for, for God to grow, he says, first begin by plumbing the depths of this love. We think that we know it. But we've only scratched the surface. And so because we think we know it, we don't visit it. And we don't find the new things, the treasures that are there in God's love. And Charles Spurgeon encourages us to go there. He says this means that it is, uh, this means that it is true that he loves us now, right now. Do you believe it? I love this. Oh, if you do really believe that he has loved you, so sit down and turn the subject over in your mind and say to yourself, Jesus loves me. Jesus chose me. Jesus redeemed me. Jesus calls me. Jesus has pardoned me. Jesus has taken me into union with himself. How beautiful is that? I think we would be wise to do just what he says and spend more time thinking about how he has loved us. Well, we're going to leave Charles Spurgeon and, and conclude this section of 1 John with the, the exhortation, so we must love our brothers. John says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. 
And this commandment that we, is, this is the commandment that we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is, this is where it becomes really, really applicable. This is where it becomes really, really hard. Because if you spend any time at church, any time at all, and some of you have been going to church most of your life, so you know that this will be true. You spend any time here and someone, one of your brothers, one of your sisters, is going to wound you. One of them is going to sin against you, offend you. It's bound to happen because of the reality that every one of us in here still struggles with sin. In fact, the reality is if, if I haven't offended you yet, I will just give it some time. And I, I will need to come to you and I will need to confess that and I'll need to ask for your forgiveness. And that's not an occasion to run away from the church. And yet, we hear it all the time, or we could even say it ourselves, the church has hurt me, meaning that someone in the church has hurt me. Maybe it's leadership, maybe it's the staff, pastor has hurt you. People say the same thing, I've been wounded by the church. The claim to love God and hate your brother are two claims that are contradictory. One of these statements is a lie. That's what John is saying. Why? Because if you claim to love God, then no pain or betrayal can justify hate for our brother. Now that's, a, that's a really strong statement. That I would say, that if you claim to love God, then no pain or betrayal can justify you hating your brother. In order to embrace that statement, you, all you have to do is to reflect upon the pain and the betrayal that you have been forgiven of. And to remember that we are all offenders. We've all caused pain. We've all sinned against a brother or sister. We've sinned against God so many times. Does that forgiveness that you've received not demand from you a reciprocation to God in gratitude? and a reciprocation to your brother in love. I think it does. Would we undo what Christ has done through redemption, in forming a people for himself, a people that he chose for himself by rejecting, separating, harboring bitterness in our hearts? Isn't this somebody who Christ has forgiven, who, whom he died for on a cross, just like you? But the problem with forgiveness is that we struggle with the pain, all right? Here's the, here's the problem, and here's the real struggle, is that pain hurts. Pain wounds. Pain leaves a mark on us. And we're left to pay that pain and experience it. I think it's, I don't want to dismiss that because that's a powerful reality in what we experience. But I do want to point out that our Savior, He also has scars. He also experienced pain. And we want to walk in His footsteps. We want to be just like Him. So for every child of God, this is a struggle. And if we've experienced forgiveness, any forgiveness that has led us to the love of God, we must forgive our brother. And this is how John finishes talking about this subject of loving one another. He's been talking about it over and over and over again. You have to love your brothers, you have to love your brothers. And this time he doesn't just command it another time, a fifth, a sixth, the tenth time that we love one another, he tells us that if we're true believers, we are compelled with no other option but to love our brothers. We must love our brothers. Romans 12, 18 says, if, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 
So it is a, it is a burden. It is uh, uh, upon us. It is an obligation that we have that, that we are to seek to, to live at peace. When we sin against someone else, we're to go to them. We're, try, we're to, to make it right. And, and also, on the flip side of that, to live peaceably with others is to receive that person coming to you to make it right. A lot of times we see that person coming to make peace with us and we, we avoid them or we resist it or we come up with excuses or, we, or we, we judge their motives and their thoughts and we say, you don't really mean it. Or we'll just see. So it's in the, it's in the receiving of that person. It's also in the going to that person. We must love our brother even when the situation is really unjust really unfair. When we share none of the blame and they share all of the blame, we must love our brother. And it doesn't mean that there aren't relational consequences. It doesn't mean that there aren't boundaries that need to be put into place, that trust may be lost. I'm not saying to an abused woman that she needs to just go back to her abusive husband over and over and over again. No, I would say be wise Have love in your heart for this person and make the sin stop. You may need to get away and give time for for God to work on that person. Wisdom may be needed to, to avoid sin continuing. But even with boundaries in place, forgiveness does not promise that we won't be rewounded by the same person again and again. That's reality. That's what we're signing up for. That's what John is saying. You must love your brother even in that condition because Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how many times? How often will my brother sin against me and I still have to forgive him? Seven times? On the eighth time, can I finally discard him? Can I discard that relationship, walk away from that? Can I just be mad forever? And Jesus says no. Seventy times seven. Okay, 490 times. Okay, good. I've got a number. No, I think he's saying that so that you get, you forgive to the point where you've stopped counting the times you've forgiven. And this is a reflection of God's love. Some of you may be hearing this and saying, that's really hard. Why would he ask us to do that? But think about how that benefits you if the God who forgives you forgives you that many times. So many times that he forgets how many times he's forgiven you. He's talking to Peter in Matthew 18, 21 and 22, and then Jesus launches into a parable about a king wanting to settle his accounts. And he he brings before him a man who owes an unthinkable amount of debt, and he forgives him that debt because he begs him to. He couldn't pay it, not in one lifetime, not in two, not ten lifetimes. This guy was in a bad place. But immediately upon being forgiven, this servant goes out and he chokes someone who owes him 20 bucks, has him thrown in prison till he can pay. And when the king hears about this, he says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And you should, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. So the the jailers came and they took this wicked servant till he could pay the vast debt that he owed to his master. And then Jesus says, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. From your heart. Not just from your mouth. Not just for a little while, but from your heart, for good. Forgiveness like this is impossible. You may be saying that. I can't forgive that way. I just cannot do it. We are ready to discard people at the slightest offense. 
Proverbs 19.11 says, Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is to his glory to overlook an offense. To overlook that offense. Our culture is so easily offended. And we need to be a people who are ready to overlook offenses, to let it go. How committed are you to loving your brother? We can't say, I've tried to love him, but I just can't. I can't, I, I've tried to love that person, but I just can't love that person. That excuse doesn't hold any water. Because if we are born of him, if we are born from God, and we are abiding in him, then all the resources for love from him, this perfecting love that entered into our lives and is now spreading throughout our lives, it's all there. And our responsibility is to respond to his commandments with all of our will and with our whole being. Let me do that summary again. This is how we know that we abide in God and he in us by his spirit, his Holy Spirit. It's, it's a sign, it's proof. And by that Holy Spirit, we confess and we've come to believe in the perfecting love of God that has been made manifest in Jesus who was sent, he was sacrificed, he was resurrected and glorified. I should put he died in there as well. This perfecting love will give us confidence, absolute confidence in the day of judgment. There's nothing to fear. We don't fear punishment. We're objects of his love. And it will also give us a love for God. It will kindle a love for God and for our brothers. So if this is true, if what John is saying is true, if what the scriptures tell us is true, we must love our brothers. Because this is what God is doing in us. Let me ask you, think about how important it is for us to love one another. I mean, it, it's no coincidence that John keeps hammering this over and over and over again to us. This self-sacrificing commitment to seek the eternal good of one another, that's how we need to love one another. And what happens when we don't love each other like that? Think about that. What will happen to us if we don't love each other like that? Will you commit to, to make that choice today? To love your Christian brother or sister despite their tribe? despite the opinions and disagreements that, de, that you're still not going to agree with them. But you need to love them. Are you committed? Can you commit to, to, to doing that? Commit to love. Can you commit despite the pain that they've inflicted on you, no matter how grievous? Can you say, no. God, with, with all the power of your indwelling spirit, and the love that you have displayed to me. Help me love them completely. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as a propitiation for our sin, as a satisfaction for the wrath of God to make things right, to bring us peace. That is love. He loved us. Not that we loved God. God loved us in spite of us. We did nothing to deserve his love. In fact, none of us, outside of what Christ has done for us, even today are worthy of God looking upon us, considering us, noticing us, much less loving us and making us part of his family. But God, but God, here's one of those big buts, but God, who is love, did show us his love and he sent his son to earth. His name was Jesus. He died on a Roman cross to be our perfect sacrifice. He paid our sin debt to a holy God. And if you surrender your life to him, if you make him the Lord of your life, he will forgive you and make you a child of God. He will, your life will never be the same. And if you desire to begin a life with Jesus, 
today. If you're on YouTube, you desire to, to, to actually start that life with God. Now, I, I encourage you just to, to speak to him. We're going to sing some songs. We're going to take communion together. And just in your heart, he can hear your heart. He can hear your thoughts. And in your heart, cry out to him and say those things to him. Say, God, I want to be forgiven. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to surrender to you. I want to follow you all the days of my life. Make me your child. I believe in you. Just say those words to him. And then talk to me afterwards. And I'll pray with you and and rejoice with you. And talk to you about the next steps of your faith. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word this morning. And it it is a long section, Lord, and uh, but thank you. It's so rich what we've seen, what we've heard. Lord, I pray that you would help us with those parts that are hard. And would we, Lord, make us, work in us so that we could reflect the perfecting love that is working in those who are being perfected, Lord. Those, those of us, Lord, who you are changing, work in us in, in miraculous and powerful and, and impossible ways, God. That's what we ask in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.